The World Health Organization says that global infertility rates are difficult to determine because it affects both men and women and it is something that most people usually do not want to talk about. The UN Health Agency also observes that many infertile women in developing countries believe that their lives are without hope, without children. Hello and thanks for joining us today. This is Our Voices and I'm Orion Itangishak. Today we hear from brave women who have not allowed this condition to define who they are as individual and productive contributors to their families. We discuss their challenges and that of their families, potential solutions, and some of the resources available in certain parts of the continent. Let's get started. In Kenya, 57-year-old Joyce Kago's three marriages ended when she couldn't have children, leaving her alone and struggling to make ends meet. Joyce is one of many childless women in societies where having children is key for acceptance. Raoul Elmondrap reports from Kenya. Joyce Kago cooks as if it was for her family, but it's for a rehabilitation center in Thika, Kenya, northeast of Nairobi. Kago was married three times, but the marriage just fell apart because she was unable to have children. Her last marriage ended four years ago when her husband became abusive. And then the husband started to drunk. When she, he came, he beat me. He tell me, what are you doing here? There is nothing I'm benefiting from you. As elsewhere in the world, the societal shame of being childless in Kenya is directed most heavily toward women, but not wholly. In our society, um, usually parents are uh, sort of identified with the children that they have, they have born. You are called mama so and so. So mama and then the name of the child that you have born. Or you are baba so and so, baba meaning father, and the child that you have born. So if you don't have a child, then you are ostracized. Adding to the shame, Kenya's obstetrical and gynecological society says, one of the biggest causes of infertility among five million adults is sexually transmitted infections. To help childless women like herself to cope and learn skills to make a living, Edita Hadassah in 2017 started the Waiting Wombs Trust. So the first thing we strive to do is to just create a space where you are free to vent, talk about it, we listen without judging, we allow you to cry if you want to. We say uh, it's a place where we offer free hugs. For women like Cargo, Waiting Wombs Trust is truly like the family they never had. Ruth Almodoy for VOA News, Thika, Kenya. Now my colleagues Ndimiake Mwakalele and Semengesh Yakoye has covered this topic of infertility in various programs and have spoken to doctors and experts. Semengesh has explored why people choose to adopt and has talked to agencies and experts about challenges in local adoption processes. Well, ladies, we have covered this topic in many angles. Uh, we've spoken to many doctors, many experts, and I'm sure you've probably even covered it on the ground. I want to read a few things that uh, some of these experts, as well as the World Health Organizations, have pointed out as um, causes of infertility. And hopefully we'll go into what some of the solutions that you have seen um, to be uh, important that should be highlighted more and more. Now, the World Health Organization says that some of the causes are untreated, sexually transmitted diseases, low sperm count in men, abnormal sperm function in men, uh, steroids, smoking, excessive alcohol intake, uh, obesity, stress, hormonal disorders in women. Experts and doctors have pointed out also that rape is often a cause of infertility. Uh, what are some of the solutions that you think should be highlighted more and more for women on the continent to consider uh, when it comes to infertility? Uh, Semenyesh, uh, what do you think? 
Thanks, Orien. As you briefly mentioned, um, for women in African countries, infertility is devastating. And at the same time, it's, um, uh, the treatment is one of the most expensive in the medical field. So once couples give up on having their own children, the second and the closest available alternative they have to having children is adoption. There are two ways to do, to do that. One is the customary adoption. And that is a way of transferring childcare to a relative. And that's very common in most African families. And the second one is the legal adoption. Uh, that is the formal uh, procedure. Cultural and personal beliefs can sometimes put a setback on um, its acceptability. For example, some women I talk to say they don't want to do adoption because uh, they believe one day God can give them their own child or uh, they uh, have a fear that they might not be able to treat the child at their own, or that the child will grow up and will start looking for their birth family. Mm -hmm. They also mention the negative reaction of their husbands, especially in the rural areas, uh, because infertility is regarded as a woman uh, problem. Husbands prefer to go for a second wife who they believe is, is more fertile. So mm -hmm. these and other misconceptions um, stigmatizations, financial burden, and even uh, procedural uh, bot uh, bottlenecks can stop families from adopting a child. And that's why education is necessary in this area. Families already believe in the Ubuntu uh, framework of families where people help each other anyway, and that if a family member passes away or can't have a child, the child belongs to the community anyway. So it's a bit hard to uh, conceptualize adoption in a African framework, but uh, Dimi, what is another uh, solution that people should be considering more and more on the continent to try to find a solution to infertility? Well, thanks, Orion. I think uh, it's been described as the last option only because of the cost, uh, and that is IVF or in vitro fertilization, which um, is literally the insertion of, um, of the egg into a woman uh, who cannot conceive for one reason or another, or one of the many reasons that you've mentioned. In many situations, you find that for a lot of women around the world, including in Africa, the cost of getting IVF is what really prevents many from using that option anyway. So you find that they end up deferring to either adoption or other ways. But you know, it's also a question of awareness because a lot of people feel, you know, this is a, it's an isolated struggle. But then I think many were surprised when Michelle Obama, the former first lady of the United States, in her book, Becoming, uh, talked about it. And I think she also really wanted to make that impact that yes, even her, you know, obviously she's so admired around the world, she had to take that route because uh, I think in the, in the particular case that she was mentioning it's because of her age at the time, she said she was 34, 35. And then uh, there are also the other options, which is also expensive, which is surrogacy or what they call uh, gestational surrogacy, where you have somebody else carry your baby. And for a lot of people, that is inconceivable. But then at the same time, it's a highly increasing practice. You find that a lot of people are using that option where they know that the baby has their genes. It's just that they're not the ones physically carrying that baby. It's a complete change in mindset and reality, I guess, for most people, because obviously the ideal, the traditional, is to carry your own child that you've conceived with the partner that you have. And sometimes when it's not uh, possible, then all these other options start becoming, um, you know, choices that people have to make, sometimes reluctantly, but uh, for the most part, some, sometimes with a lot of benefit. Health policymakers in Africa don't give infertility care, prevention, and treatment enough priority. But the agony of infertility for women, the social, emotional, and economic consequences very high. So it's very important to give enough attention and the prevention and the care and treatment should be integrated in the reproductive health system and programs. The one thing that has not also been considered is that, you know, acceptance, uh, where people may be this to reduce the stigma to not always judge women who do not have a child, because that's really the reason that a lot of people feel pressured to either conceive, either, of course, uh, through assistant technology like um, IVF or to adopt. A woman is still a woman even though she does not have a child that she conceived and gave birth to herself. I think also one of the things that uh, 
is often uh, a problem is when people don't go to try to find a solution early on. Some of these issues can be treated uh, if it's um, a hormonal issue, it can be treated if it's a stress issue, if it's an obesity issue. There are a lot of things that uh, infertility uh, don't, doesn't have to be uh, a situation if it is looked at early on when you go to the doctors. I know a lot of people on the continent uh, in rural areas tend to go to witch doctors or fortune tellers and they take their money and still don't give them a solution. And so I think that early on a uh, solution can be found if the problem is detected early on to get a favorable answer. Thank you so much, ladies. As Ndimiyaki just mentioned, women in Africa struggling to have children of their own often are ridiculed or face stigmas. In vitro fertilization is one solution, but it is pricey. From Zimbabwe, Columbus Mavunga takes us to the country's first and only in vitro fertilization clinic. Since the clinic reopened in 2017, several years after its previous owner retired, IVF Zimbabwe says it has helped about 120 women have babies through in vitro fertilization. Doctors Tinovi Bamklanga and Sidin Farai say some couples struggle to have children because of lack of knowledge and funds, but they are happy to help them reach their goals. Assisting couples to conceive um, um, is, 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 is helping maintaining uh, marriages to continue, um, the unions to continue, and um, also, um, yeah, bringing life to, to people's lives. One 30-year-old client is expecting to deliver next month after getting help from IVF Zimbabwe in her second marriage. The first one collapsed after seven years of failing to conceive. She does not want to be identified. Oh, you, uh, the blame would always come back to, to us women. Maybe there's something that you did, or maybe there's, uh, you, you didn't go well. Uh, to be honest, there was a lot of negativity coming from the backstab. The United Nations World Health Organization says failure to conceive in Africa is largely blamed on women, although half the infertility cases are caused by challenges manifest. The UN body says infertility problems are common and can be overcome, but in Africa, many governments are often more focused on health problems like epidemics, infectious diseases, and malnutrition. And therefore, infertility will tend to fall quite low on the priority list. Fertility treatment is also very expensive to the extent that even insurance companies are reluctant to fund fertility management. Patients at IVF Zimbabwe say they pay around $4,000 for treatment, a huge sum for the average person in Zimbabwe. But to clients ready to welcome their first child after a long wait, the investment is worth it. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News, Harare, Zimbabwe. We have to take a short break, however, we'd like to hear your voice on the advice you may have for couples going through the challenges of infertility. Post it on our social media platforms. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and WhatsApp. Our number is right there on your screen. Now, when we come back, we'll hear from the founder and executive director of Joyce Fertility Support Center in Uganda, a health center that is addressing the gaps in reproductive health in the country. That's coming up next. Don't go away. Welcome back, You With Our Voices. Patients, hospitals, and local communities all need support to better deal with the issues of infertility. So I spoke to Joyce Dugu Semboya, the founder and executive director of Joyce Fertility Support Center in Uganda, to see if there has been any progress in fighting the cultural myths that infertility is always a woman's problem. And the myth about uh women being the root causes of infertility is changing with the time 
uh, because of the awareness that has come in. Before, when everything was in the closet, men thought that the problem was women's. Uh, a man could go to the hospital and tell the doctor that I have brought my wife for investigation. And certainly the doctor would break the silence and say that the investigation should be for both of you. So with the advancement that we have right now in Uganda, men are becoming aware of their problem of fertility because the statistics say that it is a 50-50 cause of infertility, at least in our experience in Uganda. What have you found to be the cause of infertility um, and how do you assist in that regard? Infertility comes about as a result of a gynecological condition. Women or girls suffer from transmitted diseases, which are not treated in time. Then there are those induced abortions, which are done crudely, and later on the result into the malformation of the reproductive organs. The non-communicable diseases, like fibroids especially, which have resulted in operations that have gone wrong, has also been a major cause of infertility. Mm -hmm. On the side of tubal obstruction, which may have been caused by infectious disease, the treatment that has been ongoing aggravates the problem. Also now, on the side of the men, mm -hmm. where they have suffered the same problem of let's say, infectious disease. At your support center, when you're trying to assist um, families with infertility on the cultural level, uh, maybe on other levels, what challenges do you face? First of all, the mere mentioning that I have an infertility problem, it is a kind of taboo in our society. How can you say, speak about such a thing? People would wonder whether there's something wrong with you to speak publicly that I have an infertility problem, you know, to bring out your mind and to speak what is on your mind and to seek for other people. So that secrecy, that inability to speak is the first major challenge. And of course that started with women. When it goes to men, it was a complete close down that they could not accept that there is an infertility problem on the male side. Would you be able to give one or two recommendations that you can give to organizations that are doing the same work you're doing, uh, perhaps that are just starting uh, to help families? What would you recommend them to do, especially in your region? Maybe I would like to share that I have helped organizations to start. One is called Hope Fertility Support Center Kenya. And I have also built in other networks on the African region, like in Zimbabwe, in Ghana. And we are also working with other friends in Israel. Mm -hmm. So we have a patient charter that we share amongst ourselves that has uh, what we believe in. But the major issue is to break the silence, be able to have the courage to speak out. Because if you don't speak, no one will ever know then you need to have partnership with the, the parents and providers, with institutions that uh, address health. For example, if you're in a village community, you attach, uh, you create your su support group, your patient support group, and then you attach to the health facility. I also spoke to Mustafa Ndumbuya, a journalist working with a media development organization training journalists who are covering sensitive topics related to women and girls. With many campaigns happening on reproductive health, I asked him if men seek the help they need or consider available alternatives when they can't have children of their own. You know, a lot of people are beginning to get aware, especially men, are beginning to get, you know, involved in the conversations regarding family planning. However, on the aspect of infertility, unfortunately, there has not been much investment on that aspect. You know, the reality is women who suffer the brunt of infertility, you know, to them, this is a painful 
experience on a day-to-day -day basis because the way most of the societies are structured, women are being held accountable for childlessness, for not being able to have a child. And, but men shy away, actually, from going to the clinic, even just to accompany their partners, their wives, to check because they don't want to find out that they are incapable of producing children. So what they do is, you know, they, they, they put the burden on the woman to go do the test, to go do the checks, to find out. You know, pressure will start to mount. Families will start bringing up questions about why is she not bearing babies Precisely. Yet. And that's why divorce comes into play. Is this topic being covered sufficiently in your region, especially maybe in the East Africa community? What ends up happening to those women economically or socially? Do they have a chance to maybe even get remarried when those issues happen and divorce comes into play? Unfortunately, these issues, you know, as I said earlier, have not been on the main agenda. Organization I work for, which is called Journalists for Human Rights, it's a Canadian media development organization, and provide long-term mentorship for them to report on human rights issues generally, but specifically focusing on women and girls' rights issues. And the idea is we provide long-term mentorship to these journalists to address topics like this, like infertility. Our goal is to generate societal interest, which eventually leads to conversation around these issues. When men are worried about not having someone to pass on their inheritance, is there a, a solution for them to consider? This comes down now to, you know, understanding. For the men to understand that not being able to, you know, bear babies, it's a biological problem. But what happens is, usually, the couples delay to go to the hospital. In some other communities, they will start to go try traditional means to conceive. And that process from one traditional healer to the next traditional healer takes long. It drags out to a point they only go to the hospital when probably it is too late. But again, we know why women sometimes shy away from going to the hospitals because of the lack of trust from the medical you know, available. And sometimes the, the, the facilities are not available at all. I mean, speak about using IVF. How many women are aware that these facilities exist? Science has improved so much that conceiving today is not that complicated, too complicated anymore. But do they, do the they consider things like adoption, maybe? You should know adoption. In, I mean, I know today we have, you know, progressive, you know, young generation Africans. But the concept of adoption in itself is a completely different phenomenon in many African contexts. That the, the formal process of adoption as we know it doesn't exist. What happens is someone could take in, a, 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 you know, a relative child and raise them up as their own. That's an option. That's one of the alternatives. But what that that doesn't require you know, legal process that you have to go sign papers. But the unfortunate part is, you mentioned divorces earlier. Some couples, this has led to divorces, many divorces. And the other one is, if they don't divorce at all, it means they are taking a second wife. A lot of women will have to compromise to let the husband, you know, take in a second, a second wife so they could have, you know, a child. We have to take another quick break, but coming up next, Semengeshi Yakoye brings us this week's Women to Watch segment. She'll tell us about a woman leading a successful campaign empowering women who can have children of their own across Africa and Asia. Don't go anywhere. We're bringing women's voices to the conversation, and more than that, we're building a community of inclusion and empowerment. Here in Kinshasa, campaigns to raise awareness against the spread of coronavirus are common. But getting that information to people who have no access to water, electricity or money can be a challenge. We are here at Kalerwe Market in Uganda, Kampala, where in this whole market, women are crying out for their situations to change. For women, 
it will be better for us. I think a big thing for me is just being able to say that when these protests are happening, uh, does it turn around into policy? Our kids are raped every single day. This movement got the government to listen. It really was powerful because it showed what is possible when men and women band together and say enough is enough. It's not necessary anymore to climb on a car. I can be in any place to cheer with the people. Hello everyone. This week we have our eyes on Dr. Rasha Khalid. Dr. Khalid is helping infertile women through her Merrick Foundation by increasing awareness and changing the stigma around infertile women in developing countries. And she does that through access to information and education. Recognized as one of the 100 most influential African women by the New Africa magazine in 2019 and by the Big Girl Initiative last year, she organizes Africa's first ladies to be part of this movement that fights the stigma around infertility. Such kind of partnerships has helped produce more than 20 songs with singers from Gambia, Ghana, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Zambia to help raise awareness around infertility. Here's one of the songs from Burundi's former first lady, Denise Nkurunziza, showcasing the abuse women endure in homes because of the myth that they are responsible for childlessness. The video contains scenes that viewers might find disturbing, so viewers discretion is advised. Thanks Semenyesh, and that's where we end our show this week. I'm Oriani Tangishaka. Thanks to my colleague Dimiake Mwakalele and Semenyesh Yakoye. And on behalf of our voices and everyone here at VOA, thanks for watching. Good day. <laughs>